Hi, I'm Craig Phillips. In this video, I'm going to show you how to build the structure of your own garden office. And the tools you're going to need are chop saw, or a hand saw, cordless drills, drill bits, various size screws, tape measure, set square hammer, clamps, circular saw, a compressor with a nail gun. If you don't have a compressor and a nail gun, you can use your standard hammer with the panel pins when you're applying the cladding on the sides of the structure. Now, whenever you're attempting to build such a structure, I would always advise, do yourself a draw and work out your sizes and the design that you need. My particular office is gonna be a rectangular shape, three meters in length by 2.4 meters in width. That's about 10 foot long by eight foot. Double doors on the front. This section here is gonna be 2.4 meters and then the actual length of it is gonna be three meters. It'll also stand about 2.2 meters high here and then the pitch will probably take it up to about 2.5 meters. Now I'm gonna do another quick sketch for the actual base itself. So, so my overall base is gonna be three meters by 2.4. I'm gonna start by cutting two lengths of 2.4, and then these five or six lengths in between, I'm only gonna cut them at 2.9, because of course, when they're fixed together at this point here, with a couple of screws either end, it'll add 50 millimeters onto each one of these timbers, making it up to three meters. Then once it's complete, I will add some noggins in here to stop the timbers twisting. Once the noggins are added, again, these will be screwed in from both sides, making them nice and secure and strong. Then you can apply some rigid insulation in between your gaps to stop any cold coming up through the floor. So I'm gonna cut myself seven lengths at 2.9 meters for, to start the base frame off. So that is all the timbers cut for my base. All I need to do now is fix it all together. So I'm going to start off on these corners here, making sure we've got a nice square corner. Put them up together. I'm going to drill some pilot holes in them and then drive in some 80 millimeter screws. Get one side in, same again on the opposite side. So now I'm ready to start fixing the center floor joists in the actual frame. So I've got five spacers and four timbers in there. What you have to do is work out your equal space between them. Now, depending on what size you're doing your office at home, it might vary. Mine is 2.4 meters in length in here. So it works out about 460 millimeters is the gap from that one end to the center of this joist. Then it'll be 460 again to the center of this one and so on. So I've now cut some noggins from the same timber. I'm gonna place them in between some of these floor joists to stop them actually twisting. It makes the actual floor a little bit stronger. Now I'm setting them at 1245 spaces between them because I've got some insulation slabs that are already that size and they're gonna be placed in these centers here. So 
So that's the last noggin now completed in the structure for the base. All I need to do now is place this into position, fit the insulation, then the floorboards, and then I can start building the side walls. Now, before you work out the location where you want your office in the garden, it may be wise to check with the local authorities to see if there's any building regulations involved. Once you've picked your location where you want it in your garden, then you have to check the surface you're putting it on. Of course, it's going to weigh quite a substantial amount, so it's going to need to be placed on something relatively hard. It could be on grass, but you'd have to put some packers in the actual ground, or you put, could put it on your slabs as well. My location here is quite an uneven area of basically rough hardcore surfaces. So what I have done is I've put a membrane down to stop any weeds from actually coming up. And then I've dug some little holes and put a small concrete pad in position with a concrete block on it. This membrane is going to go around it and then a DPC course, which is just a very rigid form of rubber, like a plastic, and that'll stop any damp penetrating through into the bottom of my structure. Spot on. So now you know your frame is sitting perfectly level on all of your packs, it's nice and secure. The next stage is I'm gonna apply some insulation in between the joists and then cover the top of it with a floorboard. Although you've got a nice snug fit with your insulation in between your timbers, there is a chance of it expanding and contracting with the different changes of temperatures. So I'd advise to drill a little small pilot hole and drive some four inch screws right through the timber into the insulation. You can put four of them on each corner. So now all the insulation is finished, I'm now fitting the floorboards. The 18 millimeters, they're tantalized, they're made for external use. I'm going to apply some polyurethane glue along all of the timbers, just a small amount because this expands and dries really solid as well as it being waterproof as well. So I'll just put a small amount across each one of the timbers here. And then a little bit of normal glue in between them joints of the tongue and groove boards. So the sheets are eight before, so it's a perfect width for our office. Just using a little piece of wood on the end so we don't damage the tongue and groove section. Once you've got the board nice and snug in the centre there with the groove, you can then apply some screws to hold it into position because that polyurethane glue underneath is going to start to expand and want to push up. So just drill a little small pilot hole. Now I'm going to make a mark where the timbers are below, which are here, uh, here. And here, and here. I place that in the centre of that timber, where my screws are here, where I've made them all. I'm just going to draw a little line right the way through here. And that way, I know for sure, each of the screw that I fix in place is going to catch the actual timber floorboard below. I'm putting three screws in the width of each board over each timber. Two by where the joint meets and one in the centre. One little tip before I screw all of these down. We don't ever screw the end of the board in just yet because you want a little bit of movement and gap in there to allow you to get the next board hooks underneath that tongue and groove edge. And then once that board's down, then we can fix that in place. So now the base is completed. All I have to do now is build the walls, fit them in place, and then build the roof structure and put a roof on it. 
So my side panel will look very like my base. However, it's just a little bit thinner, the timbers. It's 2x2, but of course, tantalized for the outside. Overall height will be about 2.2 meters. So I'll cut these uprights at 2.1, because when a base section and a top section is fixed in, each one of them will add another 50 millimeters, taking it to 2.2 meters high. They'll all be screwed in nice and firm, nice and square and then noggins will be fitted in between to stop any of them timbers twisting. Of course, they will be cladded on the outside with a tongue and groove board, and on the inside, we'll be putting a rigid plywood. So that's enough pieces of 2B2 now cut, ready to start building one side. I'm gonna lay these out on the floor, just like we did with the base frame, square it up, drill and screw them together. So that's one of my sides now complete. This is going to be the back side of the actual office. What I need to do now is build two more frames, the exact same height, but just a little bit longer, three meters in length, and they're going to be the two sides of the office. Once you've built the side walls, they're really easy to install. As you can see, we placed it on the back. I got Stuart to give me a hand in it. I screwed it firmly into the floor, got a spirit level, made sure it was level, and put a temporary brace in. Screwing it into the frame and then into the floor. Then I put this second piece on exactly the same, screwed it down with four inch screws right the way through the frame, through the floorboard and into the base frame. That secured it, anchored it down really tight and then a second brace screwed into the frame, offered the spirit level up to make sure it's level and then screwed it into this second brace here. Then both in position now, we'll hold this up steadily and we know it's level. The next stage is to fit the back section. So that's the third wall, now firmly fixed into the floor, also screwed into the two side walls. It's nice and level and really strong. Now before I build the fourth wall, which is gonna be a small frame that goes around the double French doors, I'm gonna construct the roof trusses and firmly fix them into position. So my roof truss for my garden office is gonna look very like this. We're gonna start off by cutting some 4B2 in the length of about 2.6 meters in length because I want it hanging over about 100 millimeters from the actual side walls. And then we're going to create this pitch here by cutting a couple of angles on the timber, sitting them on, gluing, screwing them into position. And then once they're screwed in, we'll fix some metal plates across the top here and here. So this is the size and shape roof truss that we want to construct to bridge across an opening at 2.4 meters. So how we start off is, this is what it's going to look like when it's finished. What I've done is I've got a post, I've screwed it down to my workbench, I've made sure that it is level, yep. Then I've got my base section of the truss, which is the 4B2, again tantalized timber. Now this was cut at 2.6 meters in length. So this is this fella across here. First thing I need to do is find the center point. So double check, 2.6, yeah, we're happy with that. Center point, 1.3. So that's my center of this timber. I'm gonna slide it in the middle of my post. I'm gonna mark the middle of the post, which is 95 millimeters. So we do that about 47 and a half. There's a little mark in the middle. 
I line the center of that one up with the center of that. So the next stage, I'm gonna find the center of this post back here. I can take my spirit level, draw a little line right through the center, through the center of here. And then, I want to place this piece of timber temporarily across here. Just, just screwing it in for now. Just so it grabs into position there. And then the opposite end, place that so it's just flush to the edge of your 2.6 meter length here. Draw a little line on it, take another clamp and temporarily hold that into position, checking it straight on your line, you're right on that edge. Come back to the centre point, we've got this temporary held in with this screw, we've got our line in the centre, I'm going to place my spirit level just over the top of there. that is where my cut is going to be. So now I've got my piece of timber marked in two places, the centre of the truss and also the end. I can detach this now and cut it down to size. So that is one angle now cut. Of course, if you don't have a chop saw at home, you can simply use your hand saw, of course. So you get a little set square and where your line is across there, transfer that down to that corner. And then of course, we have that line up there which should be square. Yeah, that's perfect. So now I'm gonna clamp this down and cut it by hand. So that's my two angles now cut. I'm going to place it onto the bottom section, offer it up in the middle here. Now, double checking that it's at the center point of what we marked earlier. I'm just going to drive a little temporary screw in there to hold it into position for me. Okay. If I get my other stretch of timber, place it on. As you can see, this angle now has to be cut the same as that. So there's two ways of doing it. We can offer it up along here, hold it into position, and simply mark it at the back. Or what you should find is, you've already set your chop saw. If you've been using a chop saw, you will have the angle on there, which is round about 27 and a half degrees. And then you can recut that one. So now, the second piece has had its angles cut. Just double check. Yep, and if you're happy with that joint, we can clamp this end down. But what I'm gonna do is apply a little bit of polyurethane, expanding glue onto this joint, which, if there are any tiny little discrepancies within your cut, this glue will expand and it dries really solid so you only need a small amount on there about this much that'll place against here now before i fix this down i'm going to put a little bit more on this opposite end here so i'll take my pencil mark it about there and place a little bit only a little bit there. So now we're happy with that joint. That glue in there is starting to expand already. I'm going to drill a little small pilot hole on an angle. Just 
just through the one side of it. I'm going to take a long 90 millimeter screw and drive that in. Drive that in with the impact driver. Just pulled it up a fraction. I'm going to put one in the opposite side. Same again on an angle. Just a little small three millimeter pilot drill, which will help stop the timber splitting while it's at its thin end here. And that should work perfect for us. Okay, so before I take that temporary screw out of this side, which of course is holding this in, the opposite end now, I'm going to apply some glue onto the right hand side one. Again, pilot drill them and screw some fixings in place. What I am going to do now is fix some of these roof fixing plates. Now, if you've been up into your attic, you've probably seen these spanning across the joints of where your timber meets. I'm gonna start by putting some down on the two ends, just like this on an angle. So it bridges across the two pieces of timber. And you can nail them into position or you can screw them. You wanna probably get about six, six screws in each one. And it'll really help brace that joint together. So now both end plates are fitted into position. I'm going to take away my temporary screw and fit one bridging just across here. You don't want it to stand proud of here because there's going to be boards over there later on. So it just needs to come a little bit below that. It doesn't matter about this cavity area underneath. So that's the three plates now fitted onto the truss, nice and secure. I am going to trim the underside of there off where it hangs over a little bit, just make it a little bit safer and clearer when all the roof's in position and I'm putting some insulation on there. But that's one truss now complete, just five more to go. So my six trusses are now complete. My three walls are fixed into position. I'm ready to sit the trusses on the two outside walls. And they're gonna be held into place by these brackets here. So I'm gonna space them along the top of the two outside walls, screw them down and sit the trusses into them and then screw them into the side. Now the three walls are up and the roof trusses are fixed into position, I'm going to start cutting my structural plywood ready to board out the inside walls. So these are standard 8 before 4 sheets. I'm cutting 100 millimetre off two pieces and that way they should fit nice and snug on the back gable wall. I'm going to use a track saw, cut it down nice and square. Place the plywood against the timber frame using a spirit level marked from the top to the bottom where the stud is behind the ply. I'm using my nail gun to apply 50mm nails through the plywood every 200mm apart following my pencil line. This will hold the board securely in place. 
So that is all the structural boards completed on all three walls. But I'm losing the light, unfortunately. So hopefully the weather will be equally as good tomorrow. Tomorrow, I'm going to be cutting out two windows, fitting double French doors here, insulating the walls, cladding the outside, and putting the structural board on the roof. So my next stage is to construct the frame for the front section that goes around the French doors here and it consists of three separate pieces. A ladder section up here on one side, same again on the opposite side and then a small piece that bridges over the top. Now we originally started off with 2.4 meters wide so I've deducted the sizes from the frame and of course the structural ply on the inside of both sides which leaves me with 2,270 millimeters opening. Then the window that I've bought, a second hand one, remember, is only 1,220 millimetres wide. So I've deducted that across, which actually left me with 1,500 millimetres. Then you half that, and this gives you your size here and here. So mine are 525. Of course, if you buy your doors and they're different sizes, you must double check these sizes before you build the frame. So I'm going to start constructing it out of 4B2 timber, which is the same depth as what we used on the floor and the bottom part of the actual roof structure as well. It's a lot more stronger. If we go back to the drawing, what we've got to consider here is the back wall of it is a solid wall throughout. So that's very stable and holding the two side walls up. But the front walls up here without this framing at the moment, can be a little bit wobbly until these are in and they're going to hold it in place. So that's why we're using a thicker timber here on the front because it's a smaller and a thinner wall, of course. And it's got the added weight of the door. It's got to hold the door, the, the weight of the frame and the glazing in there. Okay, so that's my four upright cuts, two for each side. Now I'm going to cut down some smaller sections, which is the width, width of my ladders either side, which is 525. So that's my four pieces cut at 525. Next stage is now to start mounting these together. Okay, so now we have one frame, good solid heavy 4B2 frame, which will have a couple of cross noggins here again to stabilise it. I'm going to build another one exactly the same and they will be either side of the French doors. Four inches, nice and secure so we can get that big heavy frame fixed to their well. So that is now one side of the frame completed. It's got two noggins in the center to strengthen it. It's quite big and heavy. 4B2, nice and strong. We're gonna build another one exactly the same. That'll go on the opposite side of the French doors. The French doors will be fixed into them. They'll hold the weight of it. And then there'll be a third piece, a third frame built, which will bridge across the top, which will help stabilize all of the frame and the roof work. I've built the frame quite tight, so it's a snug fit. This needs screwing through the floorboards into the base first. Check its level, then apply at least five to six 100 millimeter screws through the frame into the main walls of the building and the roof truss above. Once your wooden sections are fitted either side, you're ready to install your UPVC door frame. 
drill some clearance holes, which will allow you to drive 100mm screws through the plastic frame into the wooden side frames. Then you can fit the last section above the French doors, screwing this firmly into the both sides of the frame and the roof truss above. So that's my fourth and final side of the structure complete. The two sections have been fixed into the wall, the French door frames have been fixed into them, bridged across the top, that's now secured the whole building. The next stage is, I'm going to brace up this roof truss from the inside as a temporary measure and that will allow me then to put the structural board on the actual top. As you can see directly above my head now, where the roof trusses are, I've fitted two braces in there to stabilize them. They are on an angle. You fit one up at the top corner, coming vertically down to the lower end of the roof, and that just creates the stability in the roof from moving this way. Now they're braced up, I can put my main boards on the top. Now the structure of the roof is complete. I'm ready to position my windows. I purchased these two UPVC second-hand windows. Of course, you can have your own made up and choose your sizes, but if you buy them second-hand, you're dictated to what size they are. So what I'm gonna do now is cut out two openings in this long side of the office. This is the three meter side. These only work out about 540 millimeters wide. So I'm gonna butt it up to this upright here and then I'm gonna cut a section out of this upright, move it along and then refit it in the noggin so it's a nice square rigid frame around the UPVC frame. So cutting the structural board is really easy when you've got a circular saw. However, cutting it across here is difficult from this side because of course the noggins are in place. So I need to cut them from the inside. And this is how I do it. Get myself a drill bit. We know we've come down here. I'm just gonna drill a line, a hole there, should I say, right way through. And same again in that corner. And that way from the inside, now I'll just use my spirit level and draw my line perfectly level across there and cut from the inside, of course. So that's the two window openings cut out of the side ready for the windows. But before I install the windows, I'm going to put some insulation in between all the timbers covering the whole side. And that's going to be held in place by tongue and groove cladding. So now the structure is erected, I'm going to start cutting the cladding for the outside. It's a tongue and groove board, it's 90 millimeters thick and it's got a little V-groove edge on there. So I'm going to cut a section of planks at three meters in length for the one side.
Using an orbital sander, sand down all the cut edges of timber around your window opening. Now I'm ready to install my second hand windows. As you can see, they're already glazed, so I've decided to notch out the outer edge of the frame to fit 50mm angle brackets. Using a 3mm drill bit, drill some clearance holes into the side of the frame and apply two small screws to hold the bracket in place. Now you can place your window into the cutout hole. Using a pencil, mark around all four angle brackets. Then remove the window frame and start to chisel away the surface of the plywood. You only have to chisel about two to three millimeters deep to allow the angle bracket to sink and finish flush to the surface of your plywood. Refit your window frame, checking that all four brackets are sunken, then you can start to drive in the screws into position to install your window frame. So that's one window firmly fixed into position now. Of course, we've got a small gap around there. Great way of getting around that is put some masking tape up here as temporary. And again, mask up the outside and you can spray some expanding foam inside, which will expand and fill in all the gap around there and make it airtight. Then you can take your masking tape off. You can fill in over that if you want a wallpaper on the inside, or sometimes you can put a plastic cladding sheet all the way across it and not have to fill it. And whatever finish you finish, it staggers about halfway across the frame here. Or if you're just keeping the bare wood like this, the bare plywood, maybe staining it or painting it, you can just get yourself a bead, which straddles past that 40 millimeters, goes onto your window frame about 10, and comes all the way around. Might it joints to match the corners of there, and it'll look fantastic. <laughs> So that's now the fascia board fitted on there. The next stage is to put some battens on top of the plywood. We're going to be screwed through the plywood directly into the roof truss below. They're going to allow airflow to go directly underneath the breathable membrane we put on before the tiles. Now this is a recycled polymer plastic manufactured tile. It's lightweight, it's very flexible, but it gives you that beautiful slate effect. Now installing these is a little bit different than a traditional way of using a slate tile. This particular one has a rafter eaves vent that fits all the way continuously the length of the roof and comes all the way down and butts to the back of the actual fascia board. Then that's covered with a felt support tray, which is this. This is nailed into the battens, hangs over, which allows the drip to fall into your gutter. Then you install an eave starter strip, which is this plastic device, again, screwed into the top of your fascia board. We then lay our under felt. And again, do check with the manufacturer whether you need to use a breathable or a non-breathable felt for your design roof. Now the felt only runs down to the eave starter strip here, and then we can fit our battens on top, leaving a small little sag in between the actual felt. So if the tile did fail, it's highly likely not, the water of course will come onto the felt and run down onto here and through the drip tray into the gutter. This design is allowing airflow to trickle through there and get to the top of the felt and also some soffit vents underneath will allow an airflow to come on from the underside on the underside of the felt and get the air onto the board. You place one of these on to start with and that gives you an indication where your first batten has got to be installed.
this one has a small nodule, two pieces here and here, and they interlock into this starter strip. The wooden cladding has now had two coats of paint and is completely dry. I've managed to finish off the wooden fascia board along the top edge of the roof. It's now time to paint that. So I'm going to mask up the new paintwork that I've done because it's dry enough and then mask up along the edge of the tiles and paint it. So now the UPVC doors have been sprayed. I'm going to leave this to dry for at least two hours and then give it a second coat. And that's my garden office now complete. I'm sure you will agree. It's the perfect solution when you need to work from home, but you don't have the space within your house. Internally, I've finished my plywood walls with a furniture wax, fitted some shelves and carpet, along with my bespoke corner and fold away desk. You can find out how to build these in some of our previous how-to videos. If you've enjoyed this how-to video, make sure you subscribe to Silverline Tools' YouTube channel for lots more projects, videos and inspiration.